what I wanna in a fake what I'm gonna You can hate all you wanna but you sold your pajama Now I ain't a prima donna but I built what I wanna Wanna You can say my vision's wrong The tune of my song Broke my thumb Bang into my own drum Broke my thumb Bang into my own drum Broke my thumb Bang into my own drum Who in a clapping Boots I am a strapping A click click clacking Hurrah Woo! Bootstrapping in America Woo! Yeah bootstrapping in America Thomas, we're back, my friend, bootstrapping in America. You know, we've got to, it, we're going to go backwards today. Back. We're going to talk about health care, your favorite. Um, well, I don't, know if we're, I don't know if looking at us if we're qualified for this, but we'll see. Dan Michelson, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Hey, thanks for coming in. Yeah, I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. So you're a technologist, are you? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think I'm an application guy. You're an application uh, guy, sure. Yeah, so I'm not a programmer, but um, I've just always been fascinated by the idea of trying to take... Um, uh, technology and apply it to a problem. That's really? how I view applications. So, so, so you grew up here in Chicago. Did. Yeah. What was your first gig? What's your first job? My first job was uh, selling copiers door to door. Selling uh, copiers door. This is when you were what? Fourteen. You were this, 14, 15? So, so I'll, 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 I'll put it all out on the table. Okay, I was I making sixteen thousand dollars a year draw against commission, and so I had to cover oh, my job. Was this, this is, after school? Or? This is my first year, out of, first job out of school. First job out of school. You went to Indiana. Yeah. The same with a lot of Tony's daughter, my daughter. Yep. Sister. A lot of people went to Indiana. Yep. So, um, um, first job out of school, you're going door to door. You're thinking, what the hell did I just go to school for? Yeah. Why, why did I get a finance uh, degree from a Big Ten school? Like, this is this is <laughs> this is what it. Door to door copiers, re, home copiers. Uh, no. So the, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. this is a copier that was no. You. This is how they used to be sold to businesses. You'd go knock on the door, you ask for the decision maker, and then you see if you can. Uh, oh, business uh, copiers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How many did you sell? Oh geez, I'd, I think my quota. If I if I'd made 30 cold calls a day, I'd get two demos. If I get 10 demos a week, I would get one deal. If I got one deal a week, I get four months. So that's kind of where we were we were at. But uh, <laughs> it was a very glamorous job. You uh, still remember the ratios, huh? But that's you know the cool. funny thing about it is, someone had told me that it was uh, kind of like the Harvard of sales. This is linear, and I knew I could never get into Harvard. Uh, so I'm like, wow, this is Harvard. This is close enough, so I'll take it. Somebody at Lanier told you that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This is the Harvard and, of sales. Uh, and You're was, not selling out there selling knives. And You're was, selling coffee. And I was young and naive, and I went along with it. Beautiful. So, uh, How but, long did you do that for? I did it for a year, which is uh, quite an accomplishment because the average turnover there, I think, was three or four months. It was uh, kind of grind them through. And then I was um, doing the what color is your parachute or what color is your rainbow or however it works and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And and the uh, that was sort of my epiphany was to not go find a job but find a, an industry. Right. And so I was really interested in sports in, at the time, so I thought about that. And then healthcare just made sense to me because it affects all of us. It affects um, from a personal perspective, our family and friends. And what year are we talking? Oh, so this is 1991. So this is one year out of college. And so I went interviewing people instead of taking interviews. I started to try to figure out uh, where I could uh, do something for a long, long time. And then you think of healthcare. Healthcare obviously is a, is a big industry and it's a big problem. Uh, we spend three trillion dollars a year. A fifth of the economy, a fifth of our GDP, is healthcare. And yet, uh, when you kind of deconstruct the numbers, what you find is about a third of that is considered wasted. So you got this social problem, which is healthcare really isn't working that well in this country. And then you got this economic problem, which is $3 trillion is spent. That's estimated to be $4 trillion by within five years and $5 trillion within 10 years. And you're like, wow, this is one of the great socioeconomic opportunities of our time. And so my whole career has been trying to find different problems to solve within healthcare and, and just being involved yeah, in some fashion. you're 23 years old with no money and, and an idea that, okay, I'm going to solve a healthcare so, well, mystery. And you're good at selling copy machines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so, you know, I, that copy I, machine business, really, they, gave, they, they pumped up your ego because well, that's no. a tough. I think it's just the opposite. It, it, it takes you away from your ego because you're getting rejected well, 29 got, times a day. So, so rejection, you know? you know, Tony, that used to happen to Tony. Look at him. He doesn't care. Yeah. 29 times. Number of occurrences. Number <laughs> <laughs> and, and an engagement ring worked every time. <laughs> right, right, right. Let me tell you something. It, it is about number of occurrences. And you know the old saying: you, you you can't succeed without an extraordinary amount of failure. Yeah, so. it, it's it's true, and I don't think people. Uh, I think until you've done it a lot, you can't have that type of wisdom. So, so to, you're flying to solo, early '90s. You build. Was it called Strata Decision, early '90s? No, no, no. Okay. I, I, you know, I made my way through a, a large pharmaceutical company called AstraZeneca, a company here in Chicago, Baxter, 
I worked there for a number of years. And oh, so then, when did you start uh, this company? Well, the company was actually started in 1996. I joined the company uh, two and a half years ago as CEO. Uh, the, uh, there was an opportunity to really solve a bigger problem. The company was built around helping hospitals and financial planning. Got it. And so the next evolution of the company was around cost. And so I joined the company, uh, great team that was already in place, brought others on. We've doubled the size of the company in the last couple of years. And, That's awesome. Uh, Jules told us that you, you, had to, you killed the last CEO. Is that true? Excuse me? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. no. I was actually, you know, it was a great story. A, a husband and wife team out of University of Illinois. Uh, he was started a, the company? He was a professor there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they built a, a great company. Was uh, it called Strata Decision? It was called Strata Decision Technology. And uh, a number of years ago, they sold it to a private equity firm. Uh, they had uh, served their customers well, built a nice company. And uh, we're really looking um, uh, to take the next step in their lives. And so this created an opportunity for, for me. Okay, that's that's awesome. And when what does Strata Decision mean? Well, the decisions that are made in healthcare have so much hanging on them, right, uh, from a human life perspective, but also from an economic perspective. Our company focuses on the economic side. Okay. So the decisions uh, that they make, uh, we enable or provide them data in a cloud-based platform uh, that they use for everything from financial planning to uh, financial decision support, and then what we call now continuous cost improvement. So literally bending the cost curve. Uh, we've created a novel platform that for the first time in healthcare uh, puts information in the hands of administrators, uh, those in finance, physicians. So, so give us some examples. Like I, I just you're dealing with a hospital, not really right. the patient. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. but with exactly. a hospital, you have hundreds of hospitals, thousands of hospitals. Uh, we currently work with one of every five hospitals in the country. Oh, so every beautiful. names you would know: Johns Hopkins, Duke, um, so, Yale. So just give us how many how many how many hospitals is that? I, I have no idea. So a thousand hospitals. One thousand hospitals, mm -hmm. and um, when you talk. Like, so, so what does the software do? Like, do you have a specific example? Like, how would it save me money? How does it help me in the world of finance? Yeah, it's a great question. So physicians uh, perform procedures. Uh, there's a variation between how they perform that first procedure, what supplies they use, how much time they take, uh, the technique that they use. Uh, we can show the variance between all those physicians. And if you're talking about a large health system, that variation could account for millions of dollars. And then you can look at it from a clinical and financial perspective to see if that variation makes sense and have that conversation about how to create um, more consistent practices. Do we get to see, do we get the benefits as a consumer or or is the benefits, is it a public benefit? In other words, does it go back to the shareholders? Or is it, is there consumer benefits? I'm, I'm curious about what solves, it's a you great, know, there's still a lot of healthcare issues. Yeah. What is, is this just a tiny little step into helping to solve and, and maybe, um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great question. The uh, Think of a hospital as a business, sure. not typically how we look at it. A uh, hospital is a billion-dollar business. The average hospital system is, is a billion-dollar business, operating with 2% operating margins, 2%. Who thought of that plan? This so, doesn't make any exactly. sense. So, Whose idea was that to so do So if, as an investor, you were looking at a great opportunity, this is not the one you would necessarily pursue. Now, go a little bit further. One-third of hospitals are, are operating with negative margins, so they're they're in the red. And so in order for hospitals to do well, they have to get their finances under control. Then they can reinvest in, um, you know, to your point, better technologies, uh, more staff uh, to better serve their patients in the community uh, that they serve. Uh, right now they're suffering. Um, so they're, for the first time, uh, actually in the last 50 years, we had a net loss in jobs in healthcare. Uh, 40,000 net jobs were lost. Wow. So. There's a big change happening, and you hear about Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act, and I think a lot of folks, you know, kind of think of that as from a political perspective, but the train has left the station. There's significant changes structurally that have happened in healthcare that were spurred to some extent by Obamacare, but then also other competitive uh, um, positions. The way healthcare has operated since the 1950s was the more I do, the more I make, kind of like an attorney. Sure. Uh, and now the system is moving to more of a capitated approach uh, where they um, uh, will get a set amount for a given a procedure or for treating a mm -hmm. population of yeah. patients. Yeah. And so therefore, the more they do, the less they'll make. Uh, so we're at a uh, at a, an inflection point uh, in the path of healthcare in this country. And, and to, to humanize it and make it a little bit more fun, uh, think of the record industry, right? So in the record industry in the, in the 90s, you had all of these big companies that were doing really well and along came 
uh, Napster and a few other disruptive companies, and they lawyered up and tried to get rid of them uh, to make sure that, uh, you know. Protect their business. They're to protect their business. Uh, so what, what was the end result of that? Well, it wasn't successful. It staved it off for a little while. But the size of the record industry was this. The size of the music industry today from a revenue perspective is this. It's half as big as it used to be. Mm. Um, so there was a, an enormous change in the business model that occurred in the music industry that created a smaller pie and then a smaller piece of that pie too for many of the incumbents. That same shift is now happening in healthcare, and there's an incredible amount of disruption uh, that, happening. That's a good thing, isn't it? It's a it's a yeah. one it's a wonderful thing. Okay. It's not, and I think it's important for people to understand. It's not just about Obamacare. Um, there has been a tremendous amount of consolidation in healthcare. Hospitals buying other hospitals. Two hundred thousand physician practices have been bought up in the last six or seven years. So there's a massive restructuring going on for the largest industry in this nation, which is health. Listening to you talk, it sounds like this is a combination of um, if, if technology and efficient scaling, which is which is the way every business, wherever mm -hmm. every industry, how every industry changes and how every industry becomes. We had the same as thing. As much as they try to fight it. I mean, you, you can't stand well, not, the not way. Not yeah. fighting it. Using the financial financial services, which is another 7% of the GDP, mm -hmm. but using the financial markets as another example, when they went to multiple exchanges, you know, um, and all of a sudden, you no longer owned the product, it was everything kind of open competition, you know, all the exchanges essentially died, but the value of the exchanges exploded and the volume went up, you know, um, exponentially. Yeah, it's, and the end result for the user got better. Oh, of course, the mm -hmm. consumer the well, consumer well, benefits. Well, think, think about the companies. Same thing here. Think about the healthcare companies you know, CVS, Walgreens, Walmart. Sure. Mm -hmm. Those are now becoming the largest healthcare companies in the country. Oh, CVS changed their, changes their name to CVS Health. Walgreens has opened hundreds of clinics across the country. There's a Walgreens within 85% or within five miles of 85% of the people who live in this country. Um, so not only have they now started doing coughs and colds, but they've moved on to chronic illness, and they are also opening labs. So you may or may not have heard of this, but there's a company called Theranos uh, in the Valley, uh, started by a Stanford dropout. Uh, so she was 19 years old. She had this idea about making blood draw painless and making it more efficient and then creating a whole model around it. This company is now valued at $9 billion. Uh, she was recently on the cover of uh, Fortune magazine. And what they're doing is they're going to de deliver lab services, which is a huge part of the healthcare spend, for 25 cents on the dollar. Walgreens has partnered with them, and they're now active in 21 Walgreens. They're going to be spread to the rest of Walgreens. So then every Walgreens is not only going to be a place that provides care, but also lab services. That is incredibly disruptive. There's a company called Narayana Health, which no one's ever heard of, uh, in, um, in India. Uh, they are delivering open-heart surgery for six cents on the dollar with the same outcomes that we deliver in this country. People results, you mean? Same, same so, results, same mm -hmm. clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is disruption happening on the edge. In fact, what Narayana has done is they partnered with J.P. Morgan, and they are opening a healthcare facility in the Cayman Islands so that you can go from Miami, uh, take a $500 flight uh, for an hour and a half, sure. go get the same or better care for, you know, for five Fraction. or six cents on the dollar that you're getting in the U.S. And no one ever thought that that was possible. So the art of the possible is now coming to healthcare, And this convergence is, is going to create a tremendous amount of opportunity. I mean, you saw the Apple Watch. That's nice. Uh, to some extent, it's gimmicky. I mean, it's mm -hmm, not sure. solving the bigger problem, but it shows you the amount of investment and the amount of interest that will now be on the that was on the edge that will soon become the core of health care. I, I went shopping in a supermarket the other day, Mariano's, a local supermarket. Yeah, sure. And as I was leaving, there was a big sign. It said, you can sign up for this service through your iPad where the doctor will will visit you through a video on your iPad, and then they'll do the prescription right there, and you can pick it up while you're in Mario. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the last I love it. It's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, it's brilliant. I'm no more, you know, go to urgent care. I mean, everything. I agree. It's great. And all this is good for you. All this is good, and, and I think the, the problem that we're trying to solve is the cost problem. And, and the, the, the big issue here, so think of uh, options trading, right? Um, let's just say someone took away your computer. Yeah. How well would you be able to perform? Or let's just say someone slowed down your computer sure. a little bit. You'd make be it really Make it really hard. Now think about cost in healthcare. Uh, there was recently a study that showed that 80% of doctors 
uh, could not estimate within 20% a commonly used device that they use all the time in surgery. These are orthopedic surgeons at Harvard, Yale, Duke, a number of, uh, of really big name institutions, 503 orthopedic surgeons. You're making surgeons. your whole case, by the way, but go ahead. <laughs> so it's a, it, the point is they don't have the data. 80% could not guess within 20% of the cost. So yeah. think of the prices right. Yeah. As long right. as you're within 20%, you got it right. That's the black hole that we're trying to fill is to bring that data, make it liquid, so that people actually do understand the consequences of their decisions. We do the same thing in finance. We're trying to put, we call it putting context mm -hmm. around, we talk putting numbers, probabilities and statistics around um, around every decision that you make so that there's a probabilistic outcome that is very predictable based on the number of times something happens. Yeah, and, and that data matters when it matters. The problem is in healthcare, it never mattered because the more you did, the more you make. So everyone was focused on this this idea of revenue cycle management, right. uh, what they call net revenue. Here's how much we charge, here's how much we make. Now, because it, that's becoming capped, uh, they actually do need this data. So uh, I was with a, uh, a, a big academic institution on the East Coast with their executive team the other day, and uh, the CIO introduced us as cost is now sexy, <laughs> which uh, – I don't think my 14-year-old daughter would look at it that way, right, right. Uh, but uh, what, what her dad does is actually cool. Um, but uh, but to the people who uh, really matter in healthcare, they understand and get that now. Uh, so we're kind of at the beginning. I, I call it the first inning of the game, uh, you know, in in the business that we're in. He is Dan Michelson, the CEO of um, Strata Decision Technology and. This is a great discussion because so many people are affected, obviously, in this space. And just to hear, like, just a very logical, progressive view is is really cool for our it's listeners. Refreshing, for sure. So, so Dan, thank you so much. The, your company is one of the um, really special kind of Chicago companies, and um, we just can't wait to see a you know kind of explode out of the gate. Well, great, appreciate it, and thanks, uh, and thanks for the opportunity. Sure. Thanks so much for coming on. We we'll take about a three minute break. We're going to come back. We got good trade, bad trade next. Listen to Taste Trade Live. <laughs> 